Hello everyone, welcome to the Energy Source webinar. The Energy Source is a child development center based in Kuala Lumpur, offering early intervention program, assessment and therapy services, day nursery and preschool. This is a pre-recorded webinar. Please sit back, relax, and we hope you enjoy the session. All right, so let's make a start. So good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our second um, biomedicine webinar tonight. So we've got Laurie Knowles joining us um, all the way from US. So it's morning for her um, and Dr. Malini joining us as well. So I'll let them introduce themselves shortly. Um, so just to introduce myself, I am Joanna and I am the director and a pediatric physiotherapist at the Energy Source in Bangsa, which is a child development center. Um, so today, like I mentioned, the webinar is going to be on um, biomedicine um, and Laurie's going to tell us her kind of success story with her son um, in the field. Um, so just before I hand over to Dr. Malini, just a couple of things to mention. So if everyone can just make sure they're on mute so that there's no background noise throughout. If you have a question for Laurie, um, there will be an opportunity at the end to do question and answer. But if it's really urgent or it's something you want to just type down before you forget, please put it in the chat box. And I'll, I'll either ask Laurie at the end or try and kind of find an appropriate time to, to ask her that question for you. All right. So I'll let Dr. Molini introduce herself um, and then we can go from there. So over to you, Dr. Molini. Thank you, Joanna. Good evening to all of you and a very warm welcome to this uh, second series uh, of the webinar that we've planned. Um, I'm Malini, a child neurologist uh, from Kuala Lumpur, and uh, I'm the co-host for this webinar series with Joanna. Nice uh, to see so many of you all, colleagues, uh, friends, family, uh, all across uh, the region. Some of you all are even from India, Sri Lanka, and uh, of course, uh, from Malaysia too. And um, I'm glad uh, that you're able to join this uh, session. I mean, the issue of um, biomedical treatment is so important, especially in autism, because no one single method works. Uh, and uh, when I say biomedical treatment, we're actually referring to a series of uh, biological and uh, physiological interventions uh, to improve brain development and function. Brain health is so important because uh, today kids are being exposed to, to all sorts of uh, toxicants in the environment. And I think this has got a lot to do with what we are seeing today, the pandemic in autism, ADHD, allergies, uh, Alzheimer's and the whole works. Um, so um, our guest of honor today is Laurie Knowles. Uh, she's a parent uh, of a child and you'll hear more about it later. She's also the uh, director and co-founder of one of the well-known nutritional companies. And I had the pleasure of meeting her after uh, Dr. William Shaw um, who is also one of the founders, uh, came to Malaysia to run this biomedical workshop. And um, I met uh, Laurie for the first time uh, in uh, May 2016 in Los Angeles when I went for the training uh, in, in the MAPS course. And uh, Laurie is really passionate and uh, uh, about uh, teaching um, biomedicine to everybody. And, and I think she's one of those super moms uh, who knows a lot more than doctors. And if you learn from uh, people like her and many parents who know a lot about uh, biomedical treatments, I think it is uh, really uh, excellent. Uh, may I call upon uh, Laurie to say uh, a few words about herself and also uh, start on, on her presentation. Thank you, Laurie. You're welcome. Um, thank you for inviting me. And just honored to be here. I'm very passionate about speaking about what happened with my son. And I do it from a parent perspective, which, um, you know, is a good perspective to have because parents need to understand what I went through. And they also understand that I felt what they're feeling. And as a parent, I learned that if I could look for any possible way I can to help my child that I could find success. And um, I think it's so awesome that you have this center and that you're offering this opportunity for people. And I am excited about telling my son's story so that people understand why it's so important to, to pursue 
biological treatments and biomedical interventions for these kids because I believe wholeheartedly that the most success that children will have when they're diagnosed with autism is taking this pathway as well as others and all the different interventions of um, physical therapy and, and uh, speech therapy and all sorts of really good interventions are important, but you have to you have to get the body working well. And that's what I'm gonna talk about. I'm gonna share everything that I did with my son so you can follow along with me, what I discovered and what we did for him and how he got better. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and get started. And once again, thank you for having me. And it really is an honor um, to talk to you this, this uh, evening. So my, my talk this morning is going to be um, my, about G my son's success story. So I am excited to share that. And as you can see on the front, he's wearing a cap and gown. And I am happy to, first of all, just tell you a little bit more about me. Uh, this is my fourth child, uh, Daniel, who was the one that disrupted my life because it age two and a half, we realized something wasn't right. And we realized that eventually he had autism. And once I um, was aware of this diagnosis, I decided once I got over my grief and the reality of dealing with this um, reality in my life, I started looking everywhere I can to find out how I could do anything for him that would help him get better. And so it took about four years of doing all sorts of different things that I was, that I'm going to share with you in a bit to the point where I was told that he was recovered or close to recovery. And so again, my goal in telling this story to you is to educate and to inspire hope because um, families with kids with autism need that hope and need to know what there is out there to help their child become the very best that they can be. So my philosophy is you know, to look everywhere and to try every avenue, every treatment available, as long as it's safe, as long as it does no harm to help your child, my child reach its full, their full potential. And so, um, you know, looking at all the different things that you may not have heard about initially when your child was diagnosed, um, that, that is what this biomedical approach is all about. Let's, let's go outside the box of, of treating neurological diseases and let's look for other causes and go and find the root cause and correct it. So before I start, um, I wanted to share a, a brief video uh, because when people find out, oh, your child recovered from autism, their initial thought is, did they really have autism to begin with? Uh, because there are a lot of people out there that believe that it's not possible to recover from autism. But I, my son has, and so has many other people that I've connected with. Now, do all children recover? The answer to that is no. But many kids start becoming so much better as a result of this. So I wanna show you um, Daniel at two and a half years old. I, there's some video we took of him and, um, and then the speech therapist who started working with us when we began the diet of removing wheat and dairy, gluten and casein. And she's giving her testimony of what she saw. So I'm gonna get started on that. Thank you. 
you're going to get a tubby. Give the baby tubby. Yeah. Hey. Can you help? Oh, no. Um, no. You can't growl? My dog. You can't growl? Then it'll work with chin. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Daniel got wet chin. Wet your chin. Did you wipe your chin? No. Kick baby out. No. My name is Katie Corman. I'm a speech and language pathologist. I've been working in the pediatric population for about seven years. I met Daniel in July of 2000 when I did an initial evaluation. He presented with some significant receptive and expressive language delays in what he understood and what he was saying, and also his play skills. Um, at the time, he was using some simple one-word phrases. He was following directions only if you were giving him lots of visual cueing, telling him where to go using lots of visuals. Um, his play skills were really um, uh, far behind in that he would only put blocks into a container, lift them up, dump them out on himself, very repetitive. When you tried to enter his playing world, he had a meltdown, a tantrum. He didn't understand what you were doing. He thought you were taking everything from him. He would become very possessive, grabbing onto them. It was very distressful for him. Uh, we began intervention twice weekly in his home for our sessions, along with there was some occupational therapy and special instruction. In September of the same year of 2000, his family began some, some drastic dietary interventions and we began to see some really nice improvements with Daniel. He began to um, expand his, his word length, his utterances. He began to follow some directions without cues. It was probably the most significant, uh, uh, at least a month into using some dietary intervention, but it became so rapid, his progress with his play skills and his comprehension that we actually, his goals changed almost almost weekly because he was gaining so much language so quickly. He was beginning to greet people spontaneously. He was attending to his, his environment. He was responding to sounds in another room. He began commenting on play. Um, he was engaging with others, eye contact, excited about um, activities. His receptive language he no longer required the dramatic visual cueing. I strongly, I believe, wholeheartedly that he made progress not only because he really benefited from one-on-one -on -one intervention and some strong sensory integration um, input, but also the dietary intervention. I by all means don't think his progress would have been great as great without the dietary intervention that the family was doing. Okay. So here is my before and after picture. Here's Daniel at the age of three, and this is him at age 22. He just finished graduating from the university. And uh, you can see the difference between the face of a child and you look at their eyes and their eyes tell you everything as far as um, how they're doing. And he just looks lost. And there were so many medical issues. He was very pale. He didn't gain weight. Um, and he, and then you look at this face and, and you can see that, that he's a different person and he has come out of autism. And um, so anyway, I hope that was uh, useful for you. The before picture actually was um, one of the things many parents don't do is video their child at their worst when they have autism. You don't pull out the camera to take pictures of them throwing a tantrum, you know, doing autistic things. So um, one of the things that, that I recommend to anybody who starts pursuing biomedical intervention to get a baseline video of what your child is like. So you have that to remember as a, as, as a, where they were, so you could show that. And again, my son was um, doing well with the diet and then he ended up having a um, infraction where he ate a, a waffle that was full of wheat. It was a wheat waffle by accident and he regressed. So the speech therapist said, look, he's doing what he used to do. He's not responding, get out the camera, and take a picture, get out the video camera. And we did that. And so what you just saw was not him at his worst, but it was more of him 
and his autism than, than, um, than what he had become at that point. So here's a picture of Daniel at his second birthday. Um, he didn't notice the can candle. We had to bring it up to his face for him even to see it. He didn't react to the balloons. He wasn't excited. He had no idea that it was his birthday. And he had, was completely unable to blow the candle out. So it just shows where he was. And a two-year-old should be normally very interactive on their birthday. And here we are in a petting zoo with a goat in his face. And instead of being interested, he was completely unaware. So these are some of these pictures. He was late to crawl, late to walk, very slow to speak. And, you know, really all he said was what you heard him say. No, I don't wanna. And that was it. There was no, no other words um, um, at that point. And he did start to have words and he was saying, mommy, daddy, love you different things. And then ap after his 15 month vaccine, um, that all left and he lost all those words. So um, these were some of the things that were part of his life that many of you out there know is, is typical. Every child with autism is different. My son was very low muscle tone. Some children with autism have good muscle tone, um, but he did not. And he, you could see the drooling. He had excessive drooling that he could not control. He was sensitive to light. He didn't have normal play. He never noticed children around him. I would take him to the swimming pool and he never looked at other children. Um, lots of sensory issues. All he wanted to do was watch videos all day long. Same videos over and over again. And he had lots of spells of crying unexplained crying that we didn't understand why, what was going on, why did he uh, cry a lot? So we had therapists come into the home and the therapist that you saw, uh, the one Katie Gorman, uh, she brought Dr. Shaw's book to me that, um, and gave it to me and told me even before I thought he had autism, that uh, I might want to look at this book called Biological Treatments for Autism. And I read that book and it just shocked me what I read about all the issues that could be going wrong. And he was one of the first researchers who wrote about this in a book. And so I heard about the diet and I started the diet on my own while I was even waiting for him to be diagnosed officially. There was a wait list and there might be in Malaysia as well to get diagnosed, a diagnosis. And um, he started getting better just with me doing the diet on my own. And my next step was to find a doctor who was familiar with treating autism using these biological biomedical interventions. And back then they were DAN doctors, which stands for Defeat Autism Now. And now there's MAPS, um, which is a, a, another certifying organization that doctors go and learn about the unique treatments. And um, I eventually found a doctor to work with and it's not always easy to find someone who has this training because doctors who don't have this training haven't um, been taught a lot of the different uh, treatments and interventions um, in medical schools. And, and so this is, this is a very specialty field. And then the big issue for me was getting lab testing to find what his underlying medical intervention was. And the lab testing shocked me to see all the abnormalities that uh, were going on and that helped us find the right blueprint, the right way to, 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 to move forward with helping him to get better. So first thing I wanna talk about, which is really, really important is dietary interventions. And um, there's a lot of um, sources out there that say that this is not good, helpful, that this is not a good treatment for children. And I have to say that it made a really big difference for my son. So, 
why would the gluten, they, we call it GFCF, standing for gluten-free, casein-free, all right? Gluten is a major protein in wheat. Casein is a major protein in dairy products. How does it work? Well, when someone told me that if I changed my son's diet, that he would possibly maybe start to talk, I was like, how would that work? And so that's what I asked for. Why would, why would taking out two foods make my child start to, 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 to speak better and to understand better? Well, the, what's, when I found out what was going on, it made sense is that something is underlying with children with autism where they don't have good digestion, especially for proteins. And the two proteins, casein, and gluten um, um, are not able to be broken down correctly. And so this abnormal digestion is, is an issue because um, the enzymes are supposed to break all these peptides, which are strings of amino acids down to individual amino acids. And what's happening is that it's leaving partial peptides um, and not breaking it down completely. And then these peptides are getting into the bloodstream and they are getting into the brain and to the intestinal tract. And if you look at what they're called, the peptides is called gliadorphin and casomorphin. And if you look at the last part of that, it's, it's, it's a, morph a morphine derivative chemical that has an effect very similar to morphine. So that there's an opiate effect that binds to areas in the brain as well as into the gut. So I could tell in the brain that he wasn't hearing and understanding and the opiate receptors in the gut will cause chronic constipation. And my son had both of these things. Not only was he not talking well, he wasn't understanding what was being said to him. And there has been research that shows that there are higher levels of these two peptides in the urine for children in autism. So what are the indications that a child needs the diet? Spaced out effect, you can see it right here. See that, we saw that all the time, especially after eating. A very high pain tolerance. Oftentimes these children will fall and hurt themselves and not cry. And it's not because they're tough. It's because they don't feel it. And of course, pain tolerance is important protection. Now, the other thing is limited food choices. They only want to eat those foods that give them that good feeling, that high. And just like somebody who's an addict, they only want to eat that food that gives them the, the, the addictive good feeling that causes that addiction. So then constipation, he was chronically constipated. That is a big issue in autism, needs to be addressed. It is just very, very harmful to their health. And sometimes you see diarrhea as well because the diarrhea goes around the constipation because they end up getting um, hardened stool that is impacting them. So um, if you see diarrhea, it doesn't mean that they're not constipated. And then of course the speech and auditory integration deficits as well, which was very, very prevalent with my son, which we see a lot in autism. So then there was another type that is a, that is a digestive issue. Um, I'm having prob he was having problems with food because he wasn't digesting appropriately. But then there's another area that you need to look at, which is very common in autism and it's called the IgG um, food sensitivity. So this is a immune reaction to different foods. And the IDE, which is traditionally what most doctors do, is that, you know, often the skin test, the prick test, and it's a traditional allergy where if you eat something, you react, you get hives, it's a, it's a histamine response. And that's not the particular area which causes the most problems for autism. It's the IgG, the food delayed reactions. And that affects often their behavior as well as some uh, intestinal issues. Um, 
So some of the symptoms of some of these um, allergic responses are listed here um, and that you will see. So there's a, a special test that you can get. Uh, Great Plains runs this test and it's a very accurate, good test, but this was typically what you will see. Now, this is all the dairy foods and here is all the wheat foods. And you can see how if you have this line that goes all the way to the right, that means that there's the most autoimmune or most, excuse me, immune reaction to these, these foods. And so when you do this test, and you find out what foods are problematic. These are foods that are causing inflammation in the intestinal tract. These, these are foods that are often contributing to autistic behaviors. And you remove those foods, you decrease inflammation, and you help the child to start to feel better and get better. And so you're removing wheat and dairy, and you're not having the opiate reaction. And then you find what foods that are causing this immune response. So um, there's a test that the uh, food allergy test is a test that I just looked at. And my suggestion here, and some of the things that I am suggesting is that people go slow. They start with maybe dairy and go slow and then remove gluten foods. You find replacements for those foods. For example, my son loved spaghetti. That was one of his favorite foods before we did this diet. So I found rice-based noodles and I could make him spaghetti that he loved and he, you know, didn't feel like he was missing out on something. So you just have to plan for finding replacements for the wheat and the dairy foods. And there are lots of um, options, I'm sure, uh, in Malaysia as there are in the United States. And then you have to go for it 100%. And uh, you can't just do it half-heartedly. You have to go and do it 100% to see the benefit that your child will have. And I suggest to give it at least four months. Um, but I was determined. I, I was like, this, this food is poison for my child. If I don't stop this food, I will never see the potential for my son. And I was that mom who was determined that I was going to do everything, even if it was difficult. And I was afraid to do this because many kids only eat these foods that we're talking about. That's all they eat. And you think, is my child going to starve if I remove these foods? And the answer is no. Once you find replacement and you take those foods away, they start eating other types of foods because it's not related to an addictive situation. And once that, these, that everything gets out of their system, you start offering them new foods and almost every parent I've ever talked to said their child eats better and more variety of foods once taking away uh, these problematic foods from their diet. So what happened with Daniel when we removed wheat and dairy? We saw a marked improvement in his language. Uh, one morning I went into his crib to pick him up out of his crib and he always woke up crying before we did the diet. And he looked up at me and he goes, I want to go pillows with daddy. And I went, you just had a sentence. I've never heard you say a sentence. And this was the diet. This was all I was doing. And it only took like four or five days for me to see this language start to explode. The spaced out effect that you saw in those pictures was gone. Crying spells were eliminated. He cried because when he woke up from a nap or from an overnight sleep, he was needing a fix. He hadn't eaten in a period of time. And so he felt miserable until he ate and got that, that, that opiate effect back in his body like you would see with an addict. He started being aware of other children, noticing sounds as a, you know, in another room and looking at other children, started looking at toys interesting. And for therapists, they found that his effective, his therapy sessions were effective. He started making progress because the fog in the brain went away. The constipation disappeared. And then he had diarrhea all the time because he had all this bad bacteria, which is in yeast and stuff that we had to treat. But at least he wasn't constipated and we dealt with that. 
his, his sensory issues got better. And the other thing that shocked me is that Daniel, every time he would get a, a cold, he would become, he would get a sinus infection and he had asthma. And taking away wheat and dairy, that those issues went away. We had to do breathing treatments for asthma, never had to again. And, you know, that was an unexpected thing, but a lot of children have recurrent ear infections, recurrent uh, sinus infections, and it's caused by um, an allergy to dairy or wheat. And it's very, very common. So, and then we had that regression. So this was our most, I, that I told you about when we got out the video camera, but this was our most dramatic intervention. And this is always where I suggest that, that parents get started on, to, to do the diet, do it in a healthy way, and don't do it too quickly because it can be difficult on the kids um, to take away those foods really quickly on them because they don't feel good and they go through a uh, withdrawal period similar to what you see when you take a, a drug addict off their drugs suddenly. So the next step was nutritional supplements because I heard that there was a lot of deficiencies and, um, and I wasn't a supplement person. Um, I never took a lot of uh, supplements and vitamins and I never gave my children vitamins. So this was a really new area for us. But what, the reasons for doing this are many. And this is a very also important part of treating autism and helping children to feel better. Is, is that there's a lot of nutritional deficiencies because they um, have a restricted diet, self-imposed, and then we come along and we take away foods as well. They're not absorbing. They have a lot of inflammation in their GI tract and their digestive enzymes are low. And there's all sorts of things going on so that they're, there's malabsorption. They're not, the food they're eating isn't getting into the cells and helping them the way they need to be. And often there's little uh, abnormal metabolism, inborn errors of metabolism going on where these children will need higher amounts of certain vitamins, such as vitamin B6. Um, they need help with detoxification because there's so many toxins and their bodies often don't detoxify well. So they need assistance with this. There's a lot of oxidative stress from the environmental insults and when we started, I could see Daniel improving, not only with things like eye contact, but also it helped calm him. His cognition improved. I really didn't expect it with supplements. I was really surprised about the benefits. So supplements can help with lots of these issues. Um, and again, I'm not gonna read all of this, but I just want you to see that, that um, you know, many, many kids can find benefits with certain targeted nutritional supplements to help with some of these problems that are very common in autism. What I want to talk about is um, that getting a good multivitamin mineral supplement is really important because their brain is starving for the nutrients that they need because they've been eating so bad for so long. Um, now, if any of you out there have children that eat really well and lots of fruits and vegetables and they eat healthy, then you are really blessed and your children might not have as much of an issue with this. But most of the children with autism that I've met have horrible diets and only eat three or four things and they have to be crunchy or, you know, it's just there's these issues. So it's important that you find a multivitamin mineral that don't, do not have copper or iron because often these are high in children with autism and adding just even a little bit more can be uh, toxic to them and cause problems. So always only add copper or iron if we know through testing through your doctor that you have high levels, your child has high levels. A very strong B complex is important. Most children vitamins do not have a lot of Bs because they don't taste that great. And they only put a couple milligrams and that's not enough. These children need a good strong B complexes and they also need activated forms. Folic acid often is not um, utilized well by their bodies. They need methylated forms of B12 and extra magnesium and calcium, especially if you're removing all the dairy. 
you need to have some extra sources of calcium in your diet. Antioxidants are big because that helps quench the free radicals. The, the, and I'll go into that, what that is in a minute. Also omega-3 fatty acids, uh, preferably with fish oil and also probiotics, um, which is high dose, multi-strain, good bacteria. You see this in kombucha and yogurt and uh, there are, you know, um, foods that are fermented will have beneficial bacteria, but probiotics are a big part of helping to get their intestinal tract in a good place. So antioxidants, to me, when I learned about this, this was made me understand why this is so important. It's like a fireman using water to put out the fire. And when our children are under oxidative stress, they desperately need help putting out that fire because that fire is raging inside their cells. And antioxidants is an inexpensive way to, to put that fire out and make a difference. So what is it? It's a loss of electrons, but in a practical experience is when you cut an apple and it gets exposed to the oxygen, it starts to turn brown. And that means that those cells on that outer part of the apple are being damaged and eventually die. And that's what you see in, as them turning brown. So it actually alters the structure and function and actually causes eventually cell death. And this is happening in our children when we don't give enough antioxidants to help fight this process that's going on. So what are the causes of oxidative stress? Well, they're environmental toxins that you see, heavy metals, pesticides, herbicides, preservatives and foods, the uh, PCBs, uh, dioxins, phthalates, and even mold, which is a big problem. All of these things that are coming from plastics and, and chemicals in the environment um, are all harming our children. And as well as um, we're gonna talk about yeast and bacteria overgrowth, which was another big issue for my son. Abnormal amounts of these pathogens cause problems and the products of their cellular metabolism get into the brain and get into the body and causes oxidative stress. And also emotional stress, which is a lot common with kids with autism. It's not easy being autistic in a normal world and you can't explain how you're feeling. There's this tension, this stress. There's often fear and anger of not being able to, to understand what's being expected of you. This is very, very big issue with autism. And so we need to help these children deal with all of this and to, um, and to help their bodies to, to heal and to get better. So the consequences of this stress is not only does it impair your cognition, the functioning of your brain, it causes inattention, it causes hyperactivity, your memory isn't as good, and then also frequent infections, getting sick frequently. This issue is behavioral deterioration and inflammation in general. So these are all big issues that can be helped with oxidative um, antioxidants. These are some of the antioxidants that are common, that are very, very good and very helpful that a lot of parents with children with autism may use. Um, vitamin C by itself is very inexpensive and available anywhere, giving it multiple times a day, because if you don't, the body uses it all up and there's not enough to get them through the afternoon and the evening. So you have to dose it multiple times a day. Vitamin E is very good. There's a bunch of others as well, got glutathione, N-acetylcysteine, and even zinc, selenium, curcumin. All of these are um, important and you can find these in some, some supplement formulas or just dose them separately. So um, you need to find a multivitamin that has that robust B-complex, activated folate and enough vitamins. And again, there are supplements out there that are specifically formulated for autism. And if you can get hold of those, those are the most helpful and will do the most, have the most benefit. You want to not do the chewable gummies that have lots of sugar. The 
artificial coloring and flavoring. Um, you want to stay away from those. Make sure you're not doing copper or iron, which often is included in most vitamins. So stay away from those unless you know for sure that levels are low. Um, and having enough zinc and antioxidant supports, all of those are very, very important. Vitamin D is a big deal. Many children are low. You need to test for vitamin D. Um, it you know, helps protect the brain. It's anti-inflammatory. It helps their immune systems. And we recommend 2,000 to 5,000 IUs as recommended daily, but work with a doctor on this, follow the lab results. And, um, but some of these levels are really low and it affects so many things when low levels of vitamin D are there. The other thing that we liked is, found out about is the importance of the fish oil about cod, and I love cod liver oil. And why? Because it has um, natural amounts of vitamin D and, and um, vitamin A from the fish liver. And this is a very helpful for kids with autism. And I found it interesting that, that my son had this visual thing where he would look out of the corners of his eyes at things, not, he wouldn't look at things directly. He would, when he was really checking something out, he'd move it over to the side and it would be that side glancing. And that is a functional vitamin A deficiency that is very common. There's a research paper on it by Dr. Mary Megson. And the kind of vitamin A that's in fish liver oil corrects that. So once we started cod liver oil with my son, one teaspoon a day, he stopped doing that side glancing. It completely stopped and it helped his eye contact and it helped. It's very anti-inflammatory and it helped calm him down. There was less hyperactivity on it. The omega-3 is better for kids with uh, the fish oil as opposed to flaxseed because there's something with flaxseed uh, with the percentage of kids where they can't break it down correctly and it it uh, causes a mania a mania reaction so a good purified fish oil is a good way to go and it helps the brain to function the fluidity of the membranes and the cells you it's just a really important supplement to me one of the most important ones to start and make sure it's purified fish oil, that it's molecularly distilled. You don't wanna be putting more heavy metals back into the body. You want to get those out, not put more in. And uh, a lot of people are deficient unless you eat a lot of fish. And unfortunately, a lot of the fish is toxic. So if you're eating a lot of fish, you may also be consuming a lot of mercury and other toxins that often you find in fish. So. That, that's the problem. So that's where perhaps giving the fish liver oil is a good solution. So we found that um, there's a lot of research out there regarding improvement in behavior in kids and their concentration and their mood. And they learn better once you start giving them omega-3s and fish oil. And it helps everyone. A lot of people, adults, are also deficient. And we recommend one to three grams a day um, given with food for good absorption. These are some of the symptoms of essential fatty acid deficiency. I know a lot of parents notice the small white hard bumps on the outer arms. You see them a lot of times right along here. That is a symptom of omega-3 deficiency and um, hyperactivity is a side effect of not having enough eczema. Um, and some of these others that you see as well. So this is an important part. All right, so um, I wanna just quickly show you some of the other deficiencies that are very common in autism, and I'm not gonna read them, but I want you to look at these, and this is um, uh, what medical research knows are uh, side effects of these deficiencies and why these minerals um, that I'm bringing up are so important to make sure you're putting it back in through a nutritional supplement because it's hard to get enough in the diet. And um, one of the issues with children with autism where they don't have a good appetite is, is low zinc because you need to have zinc to... So if you have low zinc, you're not tasting and smelling and you don't care about food. So 
often parents would say, how do I get my child to have a better appetite? Well, zinc often can make a very big difference. And magnesium is also very low with children, with a lot of people. And all of these, giving extra enough adequate magnesium is important. There we go. Calcium uh, can get very low if you don't supplement and you're doing the dairy-free diet for a long time. It's important to add calcium. Sometimes children will have eye pain and they will poke at their eyes when their calcium is low. It can affect their, 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 their bones, uh, tooth decay. Um, selenium is often low and lithium is a big one. And the best marker of lithium, and this is nutritional lithium, is by doing a hair analysis and testing the hair. And they oft, we often see with autism that it's very, very low. And when a child doesn't have the, the small amount of lithium that they need from their diet, they're not getting it from their water supply for whatever reason, there's more aggression, there's more irritability, there's more mood swings, there's more anxiety. So even just doing a tiny little bit of a milligram a day of lithium can make a big difference. And um, you can find lithium and, and uh, liquids that where you just dose a small amount. This is not anywhere close to the pharmaceutical lithium. This is just elemental uh, nutritional lithium that helps uh, prevent that, that deficiency state that you can define when you do hair analysis. So other things that we did with Daniel that we saw very good results with is digestive enzymes because he wasn't digesting well and <clears throat> it helps them to, Daniel didn't, he was very skinny. He looked like he came from a concentration camp and his ribs stuck out and his skin was not good color, coloring. It was very pale. Once we started digestive enzymes, he started gaining weight we could see that what we were feeding him was, new, you know, uh, getting that new, those nutrients were finally absorbing into his cells, into his body. And we saw that he was even getting better with that. And there are nutrition, there are digestive enzymes that help break down those opiate peptides. Um, and, um, it, and so sometimes people will try to do this instead of the diet, but my opinion is the diet is the best thing to do, but this is a good thing to do if you are afraid that you might be eating somewhere and there's cross-contamination, or if there's a situation where doing the diet is absolutely impossible, this would be perhaps a last, you know, a, a, a course of action that would be better than nothing. So adding enzymes are helpful for worrying about cross-contamination, helping increased intolerance to other foods. Daniel started developing allergies to everything that I was uh, giving him instead of wheat and dairy. So he started developing allergies to corn. He started developing allergies to different things that I was using. And so digestive enzymes help prevent that, become allergic to everything if you give it so long and you give enough of it. And so that helped that. It helped his bloating and gas after eating. Often you see that their, their stools um, are not consistent in appearance. There's not enough weight gain or height increase being going on. And also seeing undigested food in the stool, stools. These people react very well to digestive enzymes. And this was very, very important for my son. Now I wanna go on and talk about another big issue with him, with, which was yeast and bacteria. And quickly go through, um, it, helped, it affected his brain function. You could see um, uh, a distension. Some kids you see like this little beer belly that they have. Um, it's the cause of the uh, uh, food allergies often that come because the, the yeast will dig holes into the intestinal um, uh, surface and then foods get out and the immune system reacts. Often you will see abnormal behaviors, including inappropriate laughing, increased gas. Children with high levels of yeast will wake up in the night and laugh and be having a good time and, and they don't sleep well. 
There can even be hypoglycemia symptoms as well because the yeast is competing with the food supply that your child is consuming every day. There's an organic acid test that looks at this. Um, that is a very good test. When I saw his test, I could see that that levels for yeast were very high. And, um, and it showed me with the testing that this was a big issue for him. And it's probably an issue in over 80% of the children with autism. We also did a, a, a stool analysis, which also was able to culture the candida. And it also showed some of the different pharmaceutical agents that would work for it or in the ones that would be resistant as well as some of the natural agents um, that you can use to treat candida. So what do you do? You, you avoid sugars and refined carbohydrates because it feeds the yeast. You treat with antimicrobials and you often give probiotics as well. And so this is an issue that you really need to look at. There's a lot of natural yeast fighters out there that people will use that are botanicals that um, can be effective, um, but a lot of doctors with uh, prescribing rights will prescribe a nice statin, which is a very safe, um, doesn't go systemic uh, antifungal that, that a lot of children will find benefits from. Um, and again, the good bacteria we talked about, it helps to heal the gut, it reduces inflammation, and it crowds out the bad guys, the bad bacteria and the bad uh, yeast that's at high levels. There's always a little bit of yeast, but you don't want it to be high levels. So the things I wanna share is that supplements are not medications. They're safe when they're taken as directed and always we suggest working with a practitioner. Um, and it's just one piece of the puzzle and there's a right and a wrong way to give supplements. And every child is different. One child will react really well to a supplement. Another child, it will like do nothing for. And one child may react wrongly to it. There's a lot of underlying biochemical mechanisms going on and everybody's different. And so you just, you have to try them one at a time. And if they, it doesn't work for your child, you stop. And don't, you know, just work by trial and error and work with your doctor. And, and uh, that's the best way to go. Supplements help my son, Daniel, tremendously. And as I said, eliminated that side glancing, helped him gain weight. His cognitive abilities got better. He just had overall better health. He just started gaining weight. He just was healthier. It just made a huge difference, which really surprised me. So it's important to, uh, to deal with supplements and as a parent to have a no-nonsense approach and don't pretend, don't mix it in food and pretend it's not there. That will always backfire. Uh, use rewards and consequences. Um, I did it all wrong first time I did it and it was very stressful. So there's an article on our website that you can um, look at where I've written down everything that, that I'd suggest for if you start supplements with your child to make sure that you're successful. And my last points are be a determined parent, persevere, stick with it. I am going to do whatever I can to help my son get better. Even if it's hard, I'm going to find a way. Continue to research. Um, successes will vary. Not all kids will recover, but many will see significant improvement that will make a difference in their lives and help the family unit as a whole. And go in with it as maybe my kid will be the one that recovers like Daniel. And, and, and you know, be looking at everything that you can do to help them. And again, treating autism is stressful. And don't forget, mom, the dads out there, you gotta take care of yourselves as well and, and make time for you and make sure your health is well. Other things we did, chiropractic care, homeopathy, sauna therapy to help with detox, hyperbaric oxygen therapy for some people have helped. Again, you may not have access to all these, but if you have opportunities, might be worth trying. Chelation detoxification is an important part. It's something you wanna work with a doctor on to find out if the child has lead, high levels of lead, high levels of mercury, arsenic, very common, common in different parts of the world, especially. Make sure you're not dealing with mold you're not living in a mold environment that will really harm the children and make it hard to get better. 
and seek referrals, talk among different parents. What are you doing? What's working for your child? So there's lots of other things that you can do. And remember that this is not a marathon. I mean, this, this is a marathon. It's, it's not a sprint. It's not a quick fix. It's slow and steady. It's sometimes three steps forward, two steps back, but you have to be in there for the long haul and it will take years, but you will see hopefully improvement. So what do you do? You make changes to the diet. You add supplements. Think about getting these tests done. Find a doctor local to you that you can see and get this testing done. And um, Dr. Malini here has been training in this field for many years and she is passionate and she is good. And she is a blessing to those parents with autism and Malaysia and she is available and you have to have determination and have hope and don't be determined, don't be overwhelmed. Take it one day at a time, take that next step. What can I do to help my child? There's a reason for hope. Sorry, sometimes I get emotional. <laughs> this is Daniel before in 18 months or six months even into treatment. This was him with his dog on his Dixie, on his uh, stomach and you see that face, you see that interaction, you see there's a change in this child. And I'm glad that I took the steps I did so that my son could be where he is today. Graduating from college, the university, 3.4, has a degree and he's gonna be in IT information systems. And his autism diagnosis was removed by National Institute of Health. He's living in an apartment with two friends independently. He eats a normal diet now after nine years. Some children can never go back to a normal diet, but Daniel was able to. He, it takes use to no supplements. He took a lot for many years. He shows no signs of regression. He manages his own life without my help, and he's working and excelling at a full-time job. There's help for you in Malaysia. And I just wanna put this up there. Please make sure you, you record this information, you have it down. You can make an appointment with the Child Developmental Center and see Dr. Melanie, talk to Joanna, go to their website, send them an email, ask them questions. Um, a lot of parents don't have resources near them. And I would really recommend that you move forward and take that next step if you wanna do this. And this is my contact information and I welcome anybody to email me to ask me any questions. I'd be welcome to do that. This is my passion. I feel deeply about this and I wanna help. And if there's anything I can help with, I'd be happy to do that. So um, at this point, um, we can answer questions with, you know, we have a little bit of time for that, right, Joanna? Yep, we have um, some time and we actually have a couple of questions in the chat. So maybe we can start with those ones. Okay, um, I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Yeah. Great. Okay, so the first question is for kids whose diets include mainly formula milk and two or three other things in small amounts, how do you do diet and how to include healthy foods? Even making them drink water is a big struggle. Okay, so, um, uh, okay, I just want to make sure I understand exactly what's being said. Is this a child that's on formula? Um, I think it sounds like he's a child who's probably a picky eater who, you know, majority of their diet is formula and two or three other things in small amounts. Yeah. Right. Okay. And that's very, very common. Unfortunately, a lot of the, the formulas have either dairy or soy and those all soy can also create that opiate peptide. So um, it's very hard. My son didn't want to drink water either. And so my solution for that was to I used to give him apple juice, which fed yeast horribly. And I, he used to walk around with apple juice all day. And so I would put a tiny little bit of apple juice in his, his uh, bottle or his, his water, his sippy cup. And I would do purified water. And then I would add one or two drops of stevia. Is that something that you can get in Malaysia? It's an herb that's a natural sweetener, stevia. Yeah, and, and it doesn't feed yeast and it sweetens it. So it makes them think that they are drinking juice when it's mostly water. But there's that small amount for flavoring. Don't overdo, it makes it bitter. Just one to two drops to taste. And that's how I got my son off of demanding 
you know, juice, 100% juice, which is awful for them. It's very bad. Apple juice is high in arsenic. Apple juice is high in sugar. And it, you can never get rid of a yeast issue when you're giving 100% pure juice. So um, it's, it's looking for other ways of getting nutrition, maybe look at some protein powders. Um, but again, when you remove these problematic foods, they stop demanding those foods and they start being open. And you just have to do one step at a time, but take that first step, do research, ask other parents. Um, if you have to do a formula, the, um, the, the, the broken down formulas, the protein hydrosalate formulas, which tend to be expensive and they don't taste that well, they tend to have be re less reactive to those. Great. Um, so the next question is, is it possible for you to share the diets chart? Um, so what's appropriate to give daily in terms of diet intake? Um, <clears throat> you know, um, the, it's, it's really, first of all, you know the best thing to do is, is, is fruits and vegetables. Um, organic if possible, just to keep those extra chemicals out of their body and, and meats. And if you, the most that you can follow with just that, the better you're going to get control over the yeast overgrowth. Um, carbs, like even gluten-free breads and even doing rice, um, turn to sugar. And um, if you have to do it, do small amounts, not a lot, and try to develop them the taste for meat and vegetables. And um, I still would do a few gluten-free cookies, you know, when he went to school for snacks. I had, you know, you have to do something because you can't take away their childhood and everybody else is eating cookies around them and they can't have anything. So you find substitutes, but you, you, you deal with moderation. You don't let them just eat tons of gluten-free, sweet, sugary stuff and try to make sure that you have them eat as healthy as possible. Um, and eventually they start to like, it doesn't happen over time. It could take months and months, but you start introducing new foods. But as soon as you stop the foods that they're addicted to, they're gonna be more hungry. They're gonna be looking at other options and not insisting on that, you know, macaroni and cheese or, you know, whatever it is that they're eating that's, that they're addicted to. You wanna take those addicted foods out of their diet. So the next um, question kind of associated to that is like foods, fruits that are high in sugar, like mango and banana, should they give them or avoid them? I think if the yeast is a big problem and, um, and they're re you're really trying to reduce the yeast, um, it's best to stay away from those. Or if you give them, just give small amounts. I mean, grapes are very high. Bananas really feed yeast. Um, pears is a good option. Um, and small amounts of berries or whatever, but, but it's not gonna be a long-term thing, but just short-term, you want to limit fruits because they will, they will go and, you know, gorge themselves on fruits and that's not gonna help them with their getting the, uh, their GI tract you know, healthy again. Yeah. Okay, the next question. So is there any recommendation, rec recommended brands for multivitamins specific for autism? So I don't know if Dr. Malini would know more about what's available in Malaysia, but is there any brands that you would recommend for multivites? Well, I mean, again, I'm, I, I founded a company, but uh, that's in the United States and called New Beginnings. And we have specialized vitamins for autism and that's how we were starting. Um, but right now there's border issues due to the COVID pandemic. And so I know that if you were to place an order um, from the United States and even pay the expense of international shipping, um, you may or may not get it. Customs might stop it. And um, so, so, you know, I'm not going to say order supplements from, you know, from us, even though they're good quality. So you have to, that's why I go into the details of what to avoid. You have to look at what's available to you and make sure that you're not, uh, that, it, that, that, it's a, that it's a healthy choice. And, and I think that, again, if you work with Dr. Malinay, she's gonna, Mal, Malini, she's gonna know more what uh, options are available and, uh, and help divide that. I don't really know from my perspective, but Kirkman is a good brand. If you can get Kirkman out there, that's a, they have good brands that are, that are autism specific as well. Um, and uh, anyway, yes. Yeah. All right. Um, so the, any recommended place in Malaysia for IgG tests? I think Dr. Malini does IgG 
Is that correct, Doctor? Yeah, I sent them off to the States. Um, I mean, we do have the IgG food allergy done at the hospital. Uh, most of the hospitals do have them. Um, but again, looking at the costs, I think it's a little bit uh, cheaper to send them overseas. Yeah. Um, and the IgE food allergy, uh, those tests are also available in Malaysia. So it's not a problem. Yeah. And, the, and the thing is that IgEs are often mostly normal with kids on the spectrum. It's the IgGs. Yeah, that's right. Very, it's important you know, to do both, uh, both the IgG and IgE. You know, if you show the results to the parents, and you'll find such a huge difference. E can be normal, but G is uh, deranged. It's good to do both together. And as yeah, and the thing, the thing uh, about an IgE allergy, most people know. You eat a strawberry, yeah, yeah. you break out in a hive, you get a mm -hmm. tight thing. I mean, you give up something to a child and they react immediately. It's that delayed sensitivity, IgG, which is harder to know. You know, you think this is autism, but it could be the corn you're feeding your child or the rice you're feeding your child, but it takes hours for it to, to, to generate a behavior symptom or something. And, you know, you need the test to find out about it. So to me, you know, it's a really, it's the best thing to do because otherwise you, it's, you, it's, it's hard to, to know what foods are causing problems. Yeah. Um, okay, so I have a question that was sent privately. So I'll just kind of summarize it for you. So um, this is from a parent who's been doing biomedical intervention with Dr. Molini for about two and a half years, and they're a strong believer in it. They buy your supplements from MBNUS. So she says, thank you for that. And follow a strict G, um, GFCF diet. Um, so basically, he eats well, so they've seen a lot of improvement with therapy and diet. Um, he's now five years, um, and they've seen lots of improvement in his receptive language, but still no, um, still zero in the expressive area. So this is the only area that they haven't seen an improvement in. Um, so based on your experience, is there anything specific they could try for that? Well, there, there is a product out there that's called Speak. And it is a very, very high dose um, fish oil with vitamin E, and it's based on research. Um, and it's something to possibly consider. Um, you may have some resources to get it out there. I know New Beginnings carries it. Um, I have heard some successes of it. We, we offer it because we only carry stuff that we know works and, and we don't just bring something on to sell it. We have, we test it, we ask about it, we get reactions to it, you know? So um, it, there's a lot of people that that works with. Um, uh, uh, another supplement called uh, Carnosine, uh, O-S-I-N-E, Carnosine is something worth trying. Um, trying to think, if, you know, you might, if you email me um, individually, um, I can look at some of my other resources. I, is some of the things that I also have in my aren't, aren't in my head right now, but email me and I'll, I'll see what I can come up to some other ideas um, that I know has really helped other people, but I just not going to be able to pull it out right now. And um, thank you for sharing your success story. And I love hearing that. And I it, it, hope it encourages the other parents who haven't started this and are overwhelmed at the prospect of getting started. Um, it's, it's important to start as soon as you know it's available and go because uh, the younger the children, the often the more dramatic and quicker you see the improvement. But all children, I've, I've known kids who started at age seven who gained language. We had one as late as 16 years old start speaking for the first time. So it just you just have to jump in with both feet and move on. And uh, anyway, thank you for sharing that. Okay. So Ira says that, you know, some doctors um, say that kids on the spectrum can only reach certain level of academics and can't go any further. So I'm not sure on what grounds they would say that, but um, she said it's nice to see that, you know, Daniel excelled in his academics and personal life. Um, she's then asking, what are some of the top like safe foods that you can give to children? The top safe foods? Yeah. Anything that's not wheat or dairy. <laughs> no. um, just as I said before, focus on healthy. Try to get them loving the vegetables and find ways to hide them and put them into food and, and um, you know, fruits and the non-sugary fruits, but vegetables probably would be your main focus and, and meats and, 
you know, chicken and, and beef and, you know, just buy from good sources if you, as you, if you can from that, you know, are there any good sources? <laughs> we buy from a farmer near us that, that, you know, you know, they're not getting antibiotics and, and uh, you know, free range, that type of thing, if you can find those sources, but you just have to do the best you can. And uh, your child will respond, you know, with whatever per, uh, thing you do, you just have to move forward and don't allow anything to stop you. It's just make sure you stay away from all starchy carbohydrate diets. That's, if you do that, you're not gonna see the improvement you need to because um, you know this pathogenic yeast that's in large amounts is, is competing for that food and will, it's hard to kill what you are feeding aggressively. Just keep that in mind. So we wanna keep those bad guys from being fed and, and healthy and we want to get rid of it and start to give it, you know, agents to, to, to kill it and start getting that good uh, dysbio the dysbiosis being eliminated so that it's where the gut is where it needs to be. Okay, I have um, just a question um, that someone asked me earlier about mold and I know it's a little bit off topic, but mold is quite a big issue here in Malaysia with the humidity and, you know, dampness. What's the kind of um, management strategies or treatment plan for mold? Um, mold's a big issue everywhere, and it's really just beginning to, to be talked about. Um, and uh, there's tests that you can do for it that will show you, but the, the big issue is trying to find uh, an environment that's as free of mold as possible because it's really hard to to get better when you have mold that you're exposed to and you end up getting something called mycotoxins that get tied, tied to your body, which are harmful. And uh, the mold can even colonize inside the GI tract. So treating um, with certain antifungals uh, anti can often help eliminate that and make improvement. Um, there's also something called binders that you give, like um, activated charcoal is an example of a binder, which um, can be given to help bind the mycotoxins and carry them out of the body. Um, it's not an easy or simple process, but it's one to be aware of. And if there's any way to get rid of the mold and remediate it in your home to do so, uh, often you need to not be around while that's happening. Make sure it's done safely and you're not getting more exposed to mold spores while you're, you know, while it's being treated. And, um, you know, make sure that, that you, um, you know, that there's a lot of outside air coming in and uh, move, your ch move your child away from the source of mold in the house where if you know where it is, keep them as far away from it as possible. Um, it's, it's a very complicated question, but it's good to be aware of it. And again, I can always get more information if you want to contact me directly. Thank you. Okay, is there any more questions before we wrap up? No. So if anyone does think of some questions kind of later that pop into their mind, do feel free to email Laurie and even Dr. Malini. Um, Dr. Malini is able to do all the tests here. And I know um, obviously she does work with Laurie in terms of supplementation. Hopefully the borders will open up again soon for that, that kind of logistic service. Um, but thank you very much for tonight, Laurie, or this morning for you. It was really, really informative. And I hope, um, or I'm sure that we've, people have taken a lot away from this um, and we'll You're be welcome. thinking what to do next. So thank you for that. It's my privilege and I'm gonna um, be sending Joanna a, um, a PDF copy of my slides. So hopefully they'll be available and this will be recorded as well. And again, I'm more than happy to hear from you and I do answer emails and um, I just know there's so much hope. So hang on to that hope and keep looking and researching and. Um, thank you, Dr. Melanie, for all that you do to help people. And I just love that I met you many years ago and you have a heart for these children. And they are, again, anybody that has an opportunity to take their child to you is, is blessed because I know you really care about them and helping them get well. And uh, remember that there's other things you can do to help autism symptoms. And there's a lot of good things out there that work, but you've got to start from the inside out to help them 
to get rid of all that's bad in there and put in what's good. Getting rid of the bad, putting in what's good. And you find this out from testing. So anyway, God bless you and all. And thank you for letting me have this opportunity to share. Thank you for joining us. If you'd like to know more about our services or would like to book an appointment with one of our specialists, please email us or give us a call at the following information.